I think one of the most powerful things about what we've built, like to put a positive spin on it, is that we, we literally hard coded the ability to check a tyrannical, corrupt, centralized organization or entity existence. I'm here at Cosmoverse, and it's the end of day one. Uh, sun's starting to come down, but I got one last conversation here today. I'm here with Dang Wong from, well, previously from Steakfish. And yeah, you're working on a couple of interesting things. I think one of the things that people know you for right now is like this Valerie Commons workshop uh, group. You know, there was, a, there, was a wor there was a workshop at Nebula Summit a couple of months back. You'll be doing a workshop here. And you have some really like interesting opinions, I think, around staking and governance in general, and like, yeah. So love to chat a little bit about that today. Um, yeah, how you doing? Yeah, it, it was really we were very thankful for letting us use the Nebula conference for that. But I, I think to begin with, like, the start of Valder Commons wasn't necessarily just out of like an idea, but more of stressful necessity. I think a lot of validators initially when we were trying to figure out how to improve the governance space were very hesitant to communicate with each other because we thought it would be collusive. Yeah. Some validators were just literally saying, hey, let's set up a Slack connect channel and talk that way, which is like the very extreme end of what might happen or setting up like the potential infrastructure to have that type of collusive activity. But the thing is that you had with that problems of communicating. There's like this bystander effect where we all did agree that certain actions should be taken to improve the governance space, especially for validators and even infrastructure standards that the, and best practices sharing. But no one was sort of like taking the initiative to like group people together. And so out of frustration, I initially just called, I was like, fuck it, let's get all the protocol specialists and these validators into a room. I was just like need each other, right? And we'll, we'll make it very clear that we don't want to like have this be collusive. But then after that, it was sort of, okay, now that we met each other, now we can work together. And so the next session after that, early later last year was writing out all the problems we had, right? We literally took six hours and we started writing on these whiteboards and then just said like everything from infrastructure, standard practices, best practices inside of validators to operate them to even like simple stuff like validators can never take a break, right? We're 24 seven and a lot of us, especially when some of the smaller validator operators that really did want to scale their business to become a very professional service providers, like they literally can't take vacations. They yeah. haven't taken, and, yeah. and, and then yeah. we realized how important that type of facilitation meant to have validators communicate especially if these foundations themselves independently were not very well equipped to kind of lead and guide how the validator ecosystem grew because they were not operating them themselves and also with the limited resources and levels of professionalism they had, it was all over the place. And what we were finding ourselves doing as validators or as larger validator service providers is that we see these other chains kind of like mangle a lot of like what they were trying to do on the governance side, right? To, to, to help grow their ecosystem. And then we were often telling the foundation, hey, we actually saw this on chain A already happen. You're trying to implement this again. Do it differently this way because we've, we've seen it, how, how, how badly it can turn out or how well it can turn out. Mm. And then it just started becoming this sort of like coalition of validators that were pretty well-versed and experienced with operating their, their services. And then also with like the type of way that they wanted to express their particular opinion based on the responsibility that they felt that they took from like this sort of progressive decentralization approach. And so then the validator commons had like this sort of like tongue in cheek moniker of like crypto political party. Yeah. Right. Where it's like, Oh, it sounds centralized. Like, Oh, it's is this like some mono monolithic sort of thing. That's going to be like this voting block, which then was like, you know, in some way, why not? Right. Even though there is no collusion, having this template of, like these validators that do group together, that can like work together very efficiently, does also just represent 
the ability for other groups to exist, right? It, it's a template and it necessitates maybe the existence of another. Some might be saying like there's this like concept of, oh, you're just recreating Congress in like a two, two or three party system. Yeah. But then the fact is that like, especially in decentralization and the, ex- and the, the allowance that permissionlessness provides, right? That, that allows anyone to kind of contribute. And then if anyone can contribute, especially with decentralization, you have meaningful check and balances that these different organizations can push against each other. Similar to how like validators, like we broke down like when we were talking about validators is like, there's four things. There's validator to self, how they kind of operate themselves, right? Their best practices. Internal yeah, exactly. operational stuff, yeah, yeah. Validator to validator, how validators communicate with each other maybe in these consortiums. There's validator to foundation, how their validators are supposed to be this meaningful check and balance against the foundations. And then there's validator to ecosystem, right? Like the rest of the world, like regulators and policymakers to delegators, right? They need to communicate their governance things. Mm. And of the them, level of com- it seems like yeah. the level of complexity goes up just as you go up that 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 sort of stack, right? Like exactly, it's relatively easy to set say standards, and I think lots of validators probably have. I mean, at least like the professional ones uh, implement similar sort of security standards, at least to some extent, and then. Communicating amongst each other. Well, you know, we've got Telegram groups. Maybe it's not like so standardized, but at least like there are some ways for validators to talk to each other. But then like validators to foundation, and then like ecosystems to ecosystem. Then then the complexity just becomes so. um, Yeah, it's it's like it's it's huge, right? It's 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 nuanced, but it's also like enormous complexity because you have so many validators needing to interact with, with each other. And who best to help build these? than validators who've literally gone through the shit themselves, right? You can make assumptions from foundations who've never sort of ran their own validators and see how they had to interact with self, other validators, foundations, and community or ecosystem. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of like the, the trajectory that Validator Commons has been taking. I, I don't necessarily see it as like a collusive force, it, but it's a, a necessity that need that needs to kind of like operate in order for us to like move the... The, the the needle forward because if we didn't it's literally just a bystander sort of effect situation and we don't get any we don't get any meaningful movement uh, ahead unless of course like a validator that is enterprising enough just wants to take over everything right and they just want everything in themselves mm. which is fair and they, they have the full mandate to do so but right we need to meaningfully grow these ecosystems we can't just have the same like top five validators on every single chain like especially if it, within the context of cosmos if we're having this like multi-chain feature that we want many many hundreds or even thousands of chains we need to have we need to scale the validator set too we can't just have one validator have like one thousand chains on there did you see this uh, sunny's talk about mesh security no i unfortunately didn't get, not get to see it yeah so here the idea i think it's like quite interesting, right? So like right now, an ICS compliment, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So I think the idea is for you know chains to provide to be consumer chains and provider chains at the same time. Right? Right. So like the the Cosmos Hub and the Osmosis, right? They have their own validator sets, but they can also provide uh, interchain security to other chains. So you could have Cosmos Hub providing uh, security to the Osmosis chain, and then in return, Osmosis could also be providing security to it, and other chains would also fit in here. So basically, you have like this kind of mesh network of chains securing each other, and the idea um, is to get away from the current model, which is like a bunch of hubs, hubs with zones. Right, yeah, with zones. Um, yeah I, I thought that was kind of cool. It seems like with that mesh approach, you can even have hubs, very specialized hubs with zones, and then those hubs themselves provide that sort of mesh network security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, right. yeah, yeah. So what are, the, what are the kinds of things you've identified as, like, best practices so far in, like, these workshops you've been running? How many workshops have there been? There's been about five. We're running another one tomorrow. Yeah. I think you have the... You have, you yeah, but I'm also uh, organizing an event at the same time, so uh, I can't make it. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, like, what are, what are some of the I best practices you guys have identified and are starting to take hold, you think? Like, I think the fact that validators are able to communicate like the way they, they vote to right to at least express the existence of why even decentralized governance exists right like that that I think is important how we go about doing that I think needs a lot of improvement 
what do we do? We just like post things on Twitter and then try to like outlive the noise or like outshine the noise and hope people, because like it, it's interesting because the validators most often, especially if they're not institutional delegators, they, we don't know who our delegators are. Yeah. And so then how do we communicate with them? Like we, we say like we're voting this way. Do you have like specific strong opinions against us? Because we have to eventually get our voting power. And if we don't know, <laughs> do we put up a Twitter poll? Do we know everyone who votes on the Twitter poll is a delegate of ours or just some brigaded, some other, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that needs best practice. Do you think that validators could maybe set up some like kind of internal DAO structure exactly to like get token gated kind of like if you yeah this, that that would get that you're identified as a delegator yeah delegated. but th- that would serve as a way for delegators to signal you know yes or no or yeah yeah, yeah. I, I but definitely I, think that should happen I think yeah, I mean is it necessary because like a delegator can also just override your vote yeah and and we've seen that remember <laughs> Com- did you hear about Kava Prop ninety six yeah 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 that that stuff is like still possible and like that's you mean where the so for context like the kava prop 96 was evmos making a uh, community pool proposal to kava to effectively fund um ethermint which kava was using which kava was using yeah. right so like evmos wanted to build a team around ethermint they're looking to fund that team they make a proposal to kava the entire it, community voted the entire community voted it. less i mean we were sitting at dinner actually in paris looking at oh this thing's gonna pass and then two days later a bunch of wallets, probably the team. They're all team tracked wallets. to Kava. Yeah. Um, I had, Demi wrote a tool, and then he tracked the Demi, one of our protocol specialists, yeah. who was at Stakefish, also with me. Yeah. And it was, and and but that's the thing that we've given that ability to exist. Yeah. And and that right, not not to say that governance is completely broken, but it's that that we have to like figure out. There's like these these edge cases that we see that that, that don't work sometimes, and yeah. we got it. We've seen it our. The thing is, the, the thing that was so shocking. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's so many. There's been so many edge cases in the last year. It's yeah. fascinating. But then, it, yeah. but the thing, what's great about it is like there are case studies and they provide precedent. Yeah. Because like with with Juno, I literally had given a talk on mob rule, that type of governance at the Lisbon Cosmoverse. Yeah. And then everyone was like, "Oh, that's really cool." Like you know, maybe it'll never happen. happen. And then, and then right. And I, I love Juno. Like it's 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 amazing because like it's it's this kind of like move fast, experiment quickly. You you build up this like fantastically experienced dev team that has learned and then now is able is capable of building uh, much stronger. But it's it's like there was there was no consequence. We we all like made like some snarky comments on Twitter saying like oh this was bad this is horrible we put up and everyone liked it right and then nothing happened like the, <laughs> it's like just visit. And, and that, that I think, is also just to tie it back to how Validator Commons, the, the usefulness of it, is that there needs to be a way of a coordinated effort, even if it's, like, collective bargaining that needs to happen yeah. when there is, like, this Validator Foundation relationship with that chain. Like, what, what happens? And if, and if everyone says it thought it was bad, but then no one took responsibility of doing something on it, nothing happens. Yeah. And, and, and so it, it's... The, the, I, I remember I was having this conversation with someone who used to work at the DOJ specifically and, and now is at the House of Representatives doing like crypto enforcement stuff. And I asked them, hey, I, I was explaining to her a lot of this like nuance of like governance. And I was asking her like, hey, what do you guys look at in, you know, in the government side, regulator, regulator side? And then she, she straight up told me like, it's just in, intent. Mm. Right, like the difference between collusion and cooperation is intent, and obviously intent can very rapidly change. Right, you know, from cooperation to now we're just going to like take all the money for ourselves or something. Yeah. But then if intent is important and it's like clearly mandated, and then people can call you out for that, it's very transparent, which we have been. I think it's 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 perfectly reasonable to kind of push forward because, but let, let's be honest much less efficient to do things in a decentralized manner with, without coordination than we can do it with court. Like, yeah. I, I yeah. love, like Gregory always says this, Gregory from Regen. Yeah. It's like out cooperate the competition, right? There's much more that can be, that can be gained from like working together. And, and I think Validator Commons is like a, an example of that. And I, I would even go as far as to say it's like a public good, like yeah. how Validator ecosystems evolve. I also see it uh, yeah, as, as a public yeah. good and because really? no one's working on it, then like we're just like sputtering along. There's a lot of aspects of these chains that do develop strong because they have strong stakeholders, right? That they want this 
feature produced well and, and quality. But if no one's like speaking on it behalf of like the validator ecosystem, then like how do you do that? Yeah. You can even say the same with climate, right? So Let, let's talk about the OFAC stuff a little bit because you've been sort of vocal on that. Yeah. Um, what's your high level? High level uh, thoughts about this, you, this topic. You know, it's funny. I have very strong opinions on that ideologically, but there's also like practical sort of reason. Like, on the record, I'm very proud American <laughs> citizen. I love, you know, li living in America. But if you were to take a look at it from like the perspective of like what these protocols were built for in the first place, neutrality is like agnostic to nation states, right? It was funny because I was actually at a conference two weeks ago um, that the Global Blockchain Business Council had created, right? The guys, Sandra Rowe, who, who CEO, chairs, who had founded that, she's the one that had created all those, like, the, the, the derivatives in Chicago. But, like, all ex-regulators, right? Like, the head of the OECD, the guy who had created, like, the American Finan the, the Securities Forum, all these guys, right? Kind of scary guys, right? Amanda Wick that I was just talking, mentioning from the DOJ and the House of Reps, like. And what what was actually surprising to me is that I was having these conversations exactly about this question that you asked. They were actually like open to collaborating. Obviously, there's very strongly opinionated folks from like the regulator side who's like, yes, American imperialism and dynamism must win at all costs because they come from like a perspective of. <laughs> if we let anyone else have control or have the potential to control these neutral networks that could potentially span global network from a place where like the currency is like power from right the American US dollar is like economic warfare that it can wage beyond like an actual physical standing army right sanctions that you can make like yeah. war stop right like the, the Kurds and the Turks sanctions stop that war right from 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 attacking. If, if we want to build this the way we intentioned it, we can't have that set type of subjective, opinionated influence from a, a nation state that decides arbitrarily what, who they think is right or wrong. Yeah. Right? If, if, and and I, I completely agree with that, their, their, that perspective. But from the perspective of like what these were initially built for, maybe that kind of misses the point, right? Because like that is like a slippery slope. OFAC is gonna make way for KYC, and then KYC with OFAC and everything else that they're gonna want to have. It's gonna look very startlingly familiar, like our traditional financial system, but even more expressive in terms of what type of information that they have on us. Yeah, I think. Can you uh, imagine a KYC chain that has that that has the ability to sanction people? It's, but it's also transparent. <laughs> That's that's like the most I mean, dystopian I, I, I think, panopticon ever. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't I don't think that people would actually use it. So I, I don't see a future. What if they're given a choice? What if like the CBDC of the world that you, that you the America says, and then they replace ACH with that, and we all have to transact on that? It's like in a public ledger that they control. Because well, but well, they, they have, uh, I, like, I think I think that this the idea of a fully public, fully transparent, fully traceable blockchain. With perfect transparency, but also identity, is impossible because the stakeholders themselves, right? Like, let's face it, right? Like the corrupt politicians, yeah. the you know, the uh, tax evading whatever, like also <laughs> have to use the system. <laughs> and so the this is also a check on them. So it's not only a check. So you know, the, I think the dystopian, if if everybody gets to use the system. You know, no, there, by with no exception, then it's like a very good point. I mean, then at that then at that point, I think it's. I, I don't know that I would personally want that, but I think it's worth considering because then it's perfect transparency for everyone, even politicians, even those with power, etc. Um, if there's a sort of two tiered privacy, two tiered yeah. system where parts of the population disenfranchise people, people with no access to financial systems, etc., have to use this. But wealthy, educated people who live in developed nations, whatever, like you know, some 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 separation and some social separation that creates a separate where, where there's two systems, one of privacy and one with no privacy. I think that is, of course, that that's the dystopian future. I think that you know, one they would just avoid. levy control over everyone in yeah. the, the disenfranchised public. Yeah. 
I mean, this is a, I, I, I think, I mean, I'm not like super plugged in to like Chinese, like, you know, internal, BSN, whatever, right. like, but yeah. I, I, I think that probably those with power are not uh, as subject to like the surveillance, That's true. Um, the, yeah. you know, like all the oversight and, and the kind of dystopian aspects of, you know, the Chinese model. I think. And so this is like the dystopia, right? Where you have this inequality between, between two groups. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I actually never really thought about this. It's such a good point. Like, if, if the politicians themselves are advocating for this type of panopticon that they want access to, right? Because if they have complete transparency, then they can catch the bad guys, right? But then they themselves are subject to the same scrutiny at the same level and the ease of access to get, get that. Yeah. Then you can literally just be like, okay, it's like uh, you can call their bluff, right? You can be like, yeah. do you want this? Do you yeah. really want this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? We'll do it for you. And then, and then they're like, oh, shit, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe they might. And then they might value some of like that privacy, which begets self-sovereignty that we have. But, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not ex- entirely, I'm not very optimistic about this future. <laughs> I'm, 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 I think I'm more pessimistic. I mean, if things go right, I was talking with Ethan uh, Buckman earlier about this, and basically, you know, I, I have this fear that with blockchains, we are just recreating a lot of the existing systems, but worse. So, like, we, 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 there are several paths down, down which we can go. One of the paths is the same, but worse, right? Like, this yeah. dystopia. Sometimes may be good, sometimes maybe yeah. Bad. Yeah, and... and, and uh, I'm somewhat pessimistic that this is what's going. That this is a strong. There's a strong probability that that happens. Um, I think one of the most powerful things about what we've built, like to put a positive spin on it, is that we, we've we've literally hard coded the ability to check uh, a tyrannical, corrupt, centralized um, organization or entity existence, because right. But we have like these the spectrum of ma like tyranny of the majority, which is like mob rule, and then tyranny of the devs, which is like small group of people. Which, mm. and, and and maybe people would say that our current society is centralized and corrupt in a tyranny of devs format. The reason I like Cosmos so much, and then the, what we've been able to hard code into it, the way it was designed, and obviously it needs iteration, but like tyranny of the majority even though it is bad and can result in in situations that we don't like because the mob can just be like riled up by some crazy pipe piper who wants to do something that it still has the opportunity to check those in power mm. and and ha- still have that democratic access to change it the way that they want to have it changed with tyranny of the devs you don't have that like bitcoin do you think the bitcoin community has the ability to guide the bitcoin network that they want they, no. they completely rely on core devs. Yeah. As, as a Bitcoin holder, I wouldn't know where to go to do that. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly. know where to go these days to voice my concerns about anything that's happening Checks in Bitcoin. Checks and balances are incredible. And, and I think that if we, if we since we've been like building these financial systems from scratch, that could potentially be this global settlement layer and application layer that everyone has agnostic if it is truly neutral. We, we all have ability to, to check it that took that power. How that does manifest in like groups or like politicians or what, what not, at least we still have that. And, and I think that's the most powerful thing that we've been able to like, yeah, we didn't like try to work with the system and, and mold it because it requires like people to like go in and people wanted to take the radical approach, which is what Satoshi maybe have taken. But now we have this at least from first principles to do that, yeah. which is which is what is also quite scary about to bring it back to like the OFAC situation. If if a particularly su- subjectively opinionated nation state that has a very different worldview from other countries, they are able to get themselves into the protocol level decision making, then then we don't have that power anymore. Yeah. Like if they all because like. What, let, I won't use America, right? But like, let's say nation state A is the world power, and then they are able to influence something. But then let's say, let's say, hundred or two hundred years later, nation state B or C has a better formed way. But then nation state A was able to effectively influence the development and the protocol direction in such an ingrained way that the protocol that now nation state A and uh, B and C are using three hundred or two hundred years later 
that's the de facto one. Do you think nation state A will be able to as easily give up that control and unrest that it's grasped? No, of they, course not. And, and, yeah. and, and, and especially if they're like losing, right? They're losing that power. Of course, they're not going to unrest that control. And then, and they're, do you think they're not going to put in like checks and balances or like stopgap measures to make sure that they still retain that power in like worst case scenarios? I think like it, it sounds nice from the beginning, right? It, that that like oh it makes sense yeah of course we want to catch capture terrorists or or terrorist financiers and stuff but then what if for example their decision or their opinions suddenly flip or or are not reflective of the entire world's beliefs anymore yeah yeah I think, I think that we, I think the, I mean what what I feel strongly about and I think you also feel strongly about is that protocols need to stay neutral yeah. and this is true for the internet. It's also true for blockchains and... Internet doesn't yeah. censor at their protocol level. And then why are we suddenly trying to censor at our level yeah. too? Yeah. Right? Even at an even more fundamental level. Oh, maybe the internet's like on, on, on par layer zero or layer. But like... Yeah. yeah. Thank you so okay. much, Daniel. This has been <laughs> yeah. really interesting yeah. and we could fascinating. We could, like. we could go on forever. Uh, it's getting a bit dark. I feel like um, the lighting situation is, is going to get dire soon. So... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up uh, some other time. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you.